Hello, welcome to this webinar uh, from the Wilberforce Institute as part of our public lecture program. Uh, my name is Trevor Bernard, I'm the director of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, and it's my pleasant, pleasant duty today to introduce, uh, introduce our chair for this event, uh, Karen Okra, uh, who will introduce our three very distinguished speakers for today, Chandler Saint, uh, David Richardson, and Robert Forbes. Uh, but just a couple of words about Venture Smith. Uh, Venture Smith is someone who is increasingly well known, and I think is someone who is increasingly well known uh, as a result of our, our our efforts at the Wilberforce Institute and the eff efforts of the people here, in particular today, who are talking uh, about uh, to to make him, him more publicly publicly um, not known, uh, both in Africa uh, as well as America and in Europe. Uh, this event today is part of, of, of Black History Month, uh, which has been seen a number of things at the Wilberforce Institute, from exhibitions to talks uh, to events in, in, in public, which Karen can talk a little bit about as well. Uh, the Wilberforce Institute has a long-term commitment to making Venture Smith uh, well known, as David Richardson will, 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 will mention as a previous director of the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, and as someone who was very heavily involved along with Chandler and Robert uh, in, in, in formulating the documenting Venture, Venture Spirit Smith project. Um, it's a great pleasure to me to introduce uh, someone who is a, a very firm friend of the Wilberforce Institute and someone very important uh, in the city of Hull, uh, particularly in regard to black history, but also as important in, uh, uh, in, in some of the major achievements of Hull recently, such as the City of Culture, uh, the Freedom Festival, um, and, and, and things in particular to do with Black History Month. Uh, she's chair of Caribbean Stories, uh, community support worker with a great deal of experience in the community, uh, and is affiliated to the Wilberforce Institute as a honorary uh, an, an honorary fellow. Uh, so I'm delighted to be able to turn over to Karen, who will introduce the themes of today uh, and also our speakers. Um, in terms of housekeeping, just one thing to to make uh, to, to to remind people of uh, is that the the people that is that uh, our speakers very much welcome questions. Uh, we, and the way we do questions in this but in this particular process uh, is if you could put them in the chat function, which is on the uh, which is uh, you can see on the right hand right right hand top of your your uh, your screen, uh, and I can present those uh, either those questions directly myself to the speakers, uh, or if you indicate that you'd like to present a, a question in person, uh, we can we can um, ask you to do that as well. But but we'll remind you of that at the end of this end of this talk. But uh, we do welcome questions, uh, and we would like to, we would would like to. Uh, have, have a lot of involvement in talking about Venture Smith. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to turn over to Karen, uh, who will introduce the speakers for today's uh, very interesting talk uh, on Venture Smith uh, and the Discovering Venture Smith project. Karen. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, obviously, my name is Karen Okra, and I was first brought uh, noticed, uh, noticed to Venture Smith was uh, just nearly a decade ago, nine years ago, when the descendants and Chandler B. Saint of, uh, came to, across from America, and the descendants of Venture Smith, and opened a narrative of an exhibition of the Venture Smith uh, biography, his bio personal biography. And having speak, spoken to David over the, uh, over the couple of years, it really brought something to me that how could this story have been written? How could somebody when in all adversity actually write his own biography in those times? Because people today, not everybody has a voice. And in the work I do in the community, I always feel that sometimes you have to champion uh, people, you know, champion people within your community to have a voice. So how can we today uh, you know, see that Venture Smith in everything that he did and everything that was thrown at him and his family come through the other side, in fact, write his own narrative and which is still being told today. Looking back, and this is when I've been, you know, having chats to Chandler and to David and to Nick and the Wilberforce Institute and Trevor and welcome Robert as well. 
you, you only have to look at the work and the years of work and research that they've done and that's really intriguing. If we want to know anything about what's happened in history, we have to look to people who we trust, who can share their knowledge and experience. And so for me, it gave me the confidence to actually want to find out a bit more. And with the knowledge I have, local knowledge in the community, I just felt that it some, was something which I needed to share with the with the community. So I looked to Chandler, to David, and to Nick, and 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 the other scholars to say, how can we share that with the community? And one of the things that that you know we came to you know to to do in, in it was in 2012 was the Bench Smith Challenge Cup. Why the Bench Smith Challenge Cup? because you've got to meet people wherever they're at. If conversations are to where, you know, if we want to share the story of Venture Smith in a community uh, who maybe not necessarily have ever been interested in history, only the, what they call their own history, or they've never been to, to college or to university, not necessarily that you have to, but how can we share and learn from others too? It's a two-way process. So, Hull's a town where we like rugby. So hence Bench Smith Challenge Cup. There are opponents on the field, but the friends off the pitch. As Hull, we know that there's two teams. So Bench Smith Challenge Cup. And we, we actually revisited that on this last Sunday. And it was a really good game. Really good game in the fact that the story of Bench Smith was shared there with people who wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, ever come across the story of Bench Smith. So when we look at, you know, the Venture Smith story, it's over 15 years of research and knowledge taking Venture Smith to the public. And how can we save those stories? How can we save, you know, those sort of lessons learned, you know, share those stories of lessons learned? How can we know that the lessons are learned if we don't share them? So why does Hull have an interest in Venture Smith? Why would Hull be interested in the Venture Smith project? Well, you know, why do we think that Hull wants to, to be aware or share the story of Venture Smith, an Afri African-American story? What is the link with Hull? So today I would like to introduce you to, to three people who I know, who have studied for a long time, who've got to know Venture Smith, and they'd like to share their story. So they're going to look at the history, the present and the future, and why is Venture Smith a, a multidiscipline story, uh, not just of the past, but present day and the future. So I would like to introduce Professor David Richardson, former director of Wilberforce Institute, University of Hull, as one of our first guest speakers. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Karen, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I do appreciate it, and I, I do appreciate the work that you do in promoting not just the story of Venture Smith within the city of Hull, but also the work that you do more generally in promoting the Freedom Festival in the city. I think it's very important. Um, as most people will not know who are listening, you are a pivotal figure in bringing the City of Culture Award to the, to the city of Hull a few years ago and the Freedom Festival has grown on the back of that. Uh, let me begin by saying something about my own involvement in the, in the Venture Smith project. Um, that began in 2005, which was the bicentenary year of Venture Smith's death. Uh, that was a year after I was visiting scholar at Yale University, where I had met uh, Rob, and uh, Chandler, two other principals involved in the project. Um, in 2005, while I was visiting Yale, I was also actively engaged with others in Hull in founding the Wilberforce Institute as a city university partnership. And it was clear to me that Venture Smith's life story was highly pertinent to the proposed research agenda of the Institute, which we were developing and which aimed to explore both historic and contemporary slavery um, and efforts to eradicate them. It was a pioneering research agenda at that time, 
that like-minded institutes elsewhere have since chosen to follow and I include in that the um, uh, the Institute at Yale which I visited in 2004. Today I want briefly to outline how Venture Smith's story helps to inform the Wilberforce research agenda or to put it slightly differently why I think the, uh, the Venture Smith project adds value to the work of the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, others will talk about lessons from its research methodology. I will focus on some themes or issues raised by Venture's life. Venture Smith was first and foremost a storyteller. At its heart, his narrative published in 1798 was a story about freedom and its associated virtues. It was a quintessential American story, written by a self-defined African-American. Although he'd been born in uh, uh, Africa, as he mentions in his narrative, he'd been resident of the United States, as he put it, uh, for some 60 years uh, by the time that he wrote the narrative. But it was also a narrative uh, that contemporary enlightened Britons could appreciate. It actually appeared uh, at the height of the abolitionist uh, slave trade abolition movement in Britain. It embodied several core messages about slavery, abolition and their legacies that still resonate today. And I want to note three, and I'm happy to talk about these and other things uh, with people at the end of this uh, webinar. The first, the three things. First, in common with others in Britain and the USA at the time, Venture insisted on the rights of Africans to freedom as part of a shared global humanity. As a former slave, Venture was determined to show that enslaved Africans had identities. They were more than property. They were people with histories, beliefs, ambitions, talents and family ties. Though not an anti-slavery tract, although sometimes it's called an anti-slavery tract, I don't think uh, either Rob or Chandler or I think it is, though not an anti-slavery tract in the same way, say, that Equiano's was, his narrative was consonant with suggestions of an 18th century transatlantic humanitarian revolution based on notions of human benevolence and empathy. And that uh, revolution is now recognized as having informed the rise of anti-slavery activity in Britain and elsewhere from the 1770s onwards. And when I talk about that, I'm really referring to the work of Stephen Pinker, um, a social psychologist who, who published a magnificent book uh, almost 10 years ago. Acknowledging Africans' innate right to freedom was central to that revolution, it was also pivotal to Venture Smith's story. The second thing, though he had regained uh, in America in 1765, the freedom he had lost in Africa around 1739 as a child, Venture also recognized in 1798, slavery's identification with racism as a powerful obstacle to African Americans' realization of their human potential as free people. Slavery and racism were not necessarily bedfellows. Um, indeed, uh, there are, of course, we've been recently reminded that David Hume, an 18th century Scottish philosopher, who also uh, was uh, very much opposed to slavery and the slave trade, nevertheless seems to have uh, propagated some racist uh, opinions at times. So slavery and racism were not necessarily bedfellows, but as a justification for enslaving Africans, racism had a poisonous legacy, shaping in particular white attitudes to blacks and in doing so, fostering systemic patterns of social disadvantage and division. 200 years on from Venture's observation, 
racism and its associated costs continue to disfigure societies linked historically with transatlantic slavery. Venture recognized that legally ending slavery was not the same as emancipation. Third thought, though a pessimist about race relations, Venture offered clues in his narratives about how patterns of systemic disadvantage might be challenged. His own story has a strong empowering element, revealing how racism and disadvantage need not be insuperable barriers to improving personal welfare or wider uh, social well-being. Even more significantly, his story reveals the social benefits that can arise when, regardless of race or culture, people agree to collaborate rather than look to exploit difference for personal gain. Venture's recovery of freedom in 1765 involved a financial contract with his final owner, Oliver Smith. They agreed a deal and eventually uh, Chandler uh, uh, Venture accumulated sufficient funding in order to buy himself out of slavery. They later undertook joint projects to their mutual benefit. I would argue that theirs was in microcosm, a partnership for positive change that mirrored the uniting of free and enslaved Africans on the one hand and ordinary yet enlightened Britons in efforts to outlaw British slave trading between 1787 and 1807. I will argue that in a book which I've got forthcoming with Yale in early 2002. It was a model of social change based on mutual respect and cooperation rather than division, from which I would argue we can learn much in our efforts to expose the costs of slavery and racism in the 21st century. Education, and I'd include the Venture Smith project as part of this, education is vital in promoting understanding across cultural or other boundaries. But positive social change requires individual and collective collaborations that transcend such boundaries. So freedom and slavery, past, present and future, Venture Smith's remarkable life story, I believe, continues to speak to all three. And thank you for your time and for listening. Thank you, David. It, you know, it's quite compelling uh, that those story, the, the story of Venture Smith uh, is, is evident today. It's, it could be a story told today. Yeah, it's, so thank you for that. And now I would like to introduce Chandler B. Saint who has worked really closely with the Venture Smith descendants and, and sharing the story, not just across in America, but in, in England, and especially in Hull and the Wilbur Force Institute. Chandler. Chandler, you just need to turn on your audio, your, your microphone. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, Venture Smith is the most documented survivor and the iconic story of the Middle Passage and self-redemption because of the documenting Venture Smith project. Uh, my background and expertise is in historic preservation. And since the 1990s, I've been involved in identifying and saving freedom sites and especially those linked to abolitionism in Connecticut, Harriet Beecher Stowe's birthplace, Prudent Cran Prudence Crandall School and others. Um, I'm a product of the civil rights movement of the late 50s and the 60s and was a close friend of the singer, songwriter and social activist, uh, Pete Seeger, uh, the first patron of the Documenting Venture Smith Project. In 2001, I was asked to look at two sites reputed to be linked to Venture Smith that were in danger in Connecticut. Um, there are more remaining sites related to Venture Smith than any other survivor of the Middle Passage to the Americas. 
uh, three farms, his gravesite with tombstone, a house he built, the fort in Africa. Uh, these total six directly connected and a significant number of others associated with him. To be able to save, maintain, and fund a preservation project, the person or event central to it must be uh, recognized by the public and the establishment. Uh, one of the Connecticut sites I examined clearly was important, was endangered, and needed to be saved. To do this, Venture Smith had to become fact, important, and well known. As a preservation, the first question I asked was, are the stories about Venture true or just folklore? It, if there was going to, if we were going to save the Haddam Neck farm site and the Stonington Point Stanton house, we needed to be certain of the facts. Because of the marginalization and stereotyping of African and African Americans, Venture, this great historic figure, was seen more as a folklore figure who swung a big ax. Um, one very legitimate scholar had even branded him the Black Paul Bunyan and not seen as the intellectual, educated, and extremely articulate man he was. In the end, the project was able to prove the Stanton house was the wrong one. Uh, the brother's house, which Venture had lived in, had burned down, and the current owners uh, were trying to use Venture's story to save their own house. In 2004, David, Rob, and I realized the best way to understand Venture Smith determine who he really was, sort out facts from fiction, and then share this history with the public was a research project. So on September 19th, 2005, we launched the Documenting Venture Smith Project. I, was extremely, I am extremely proud of what we have accomplished in developing a very accurate and detailed story of Venture Smith the exhibits, websites, and books I have produced. But I am equally proud of the project as a model. Uh, by using an interdisciplinary approach, we assembled many researchers and experts from outside the traditional history world, surveyors, politicians, a philosopher, tax lawyer, even a farmer and a sailor and others people who had personal hands-on expertise in the things that Venture had done in his life. I believe the research and documentation by these people in their areas of personal knowledge has produced a picture of Venture that is much more realer to members of the general public than traditional hist historic research and writing would have been. Uh, this model shows us how much can be uncovered and learned about any obscure figure using an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we started with three things. Venture Smith's narrative, descendants of Venture and his owners, and the folklore stories about him. To some degree, all these resources were mischaracterized. Uh, the importance of the descendants, especially how they have kept alive the story, has been undervalued. The narrative has been marginalized by the stereotyping of African Americans. In a way, the narrative is a threat to the establishment. To have a literary work by a former slave that is better written, more insightful, and more articulate than anything them by any of his former owners or community leaders is not acceptable. The solution has been to categorize it as an ad to, to slave narrative. It is not a slave narrative, it is his autobiography. To call it one is to disrespect Venture, who saw his being captured in this, in the, enslaved as extremely unfortunate. By, but by the culture he was educated and raised in, it was to be a temporary condition. For Venture, the right to redemption always existed, no matter how difficult to achieve. Uh, the biggest problem has been the folklore stories. Ironically, because of the racial bias, uh, the, the system... Um, 
in the case of African American history requires we prove facts. In the folklore uh, story, in, we prove the facts in the folklore stories. In the case of Venture, many of these were stories were created in 1889 by the Haddam, Connecticut Town Historian, who published them in a re reprint of Venture Smith's narrative. He claims there was even uh, a, na a name scribe, but gives no source or proof. But clearly, it was important to cast uh, Venture as the standard illiterate African American, uh, not capable of writing a literary masterpiece. After 15 years of research, the documenting Venture Smith project is now focusing not just on history, but more importantly, in using our work to preserve the sites and put Venture in the public domain. To do this, the project has sponsored and produced reprints of the narrative, recorded an audio reading of the narrative, translated it into an African language so we can share his story with the people from where he came. Uh, we are heavily engaged in public outreach, especially in schools, and recognize the importance of providing materials to schools and schools. A good example of this kind of work is here in Hull, where last Sunday, the under 11s rugby teams of East and West Hall played the Venture Smith Challenge Cup game. Um, played at a major professional stadium. The entire day was devoted to fighting racism. Here you saw mainly white working class kids and their parents all participating. Venture brought out the High Lord Mayor, the Young Mayor, the West Hall MP and senior police officers. Most important, the medals, the shirts, the programs were sponsored by a police organization, sports bodies and private business. Uh, the documenting Venture Smith project gave each of the players a copy of Venture's narrative and a tote bag. The event showed that here in Hull, Venture has made an impact and brought out the best in the community. Um, now in the US, important politicians want to be seen in public schools promoting Venture as a role model uh, for overcoming extreme adversity and doing it in a nonviolent manner, thus getting us into public venues and schools for programs. Um, we are planning to launch a new app and exhibition um, in Washington, D.C. in February that will be live linked into schools, enabling interactive programs that bring our scholars and descendants together with the students. Venture was proud of what he did and accomplished in his life and wanted to be remembered. Thus, he wrote and published his autobiography, which is our greatest tool in telling his story and empowering youth today. Um, thank you, everybody, and welcome questions. Thank you, Chandler. We're going, we're going to go both questions after uh, right. Robert has, has, has spoken. And and uh, you know exactly what Chandler said that we need to take it in you know to the public and it was really good uh, it, it it was a really good day sending that you know sending messages sharing stories on Sunday so I'd now like to uh, introduce Robert Forbes who has been instrumental uh, in the Venture Smith story uh, working with David Richardson and Chandler Beeson welcome Robert thanks Karen and it's it's really very exciting to be here. Um, I, I want to extend my my deep thanks to the Wilberforce Institute for for everything that they've been doing. Uh, it's uh, it's very important work, and I love that it uh, that it commemorates uh, William Wilberforce, uh, who I think is one of history's great figures. So Mark Twain once said, "What gets us into trouble." is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. A huge part of the work of the Documenting Venture Smith Project has, as 
Chandler mentioned, has been clearing away the underbrush of late 19th century fable and folklore surrounding venture and the narrative in particular. One of Chandler Saint's great strengths is the ability to look at something and see what's there and not what everyone has been told is there. A great deal of what we think we know about venture comes from the Reverend H.M. Selden's Traditions of Venture, printed as an appendix to his 1896 edition of the narrative. Selden's traditions fall so firmly into the genre of fables and tall tales as to make them virtually unusable as historical sources. And it's important to uh, keep in mind that this was produced uh, squarely in the nadir of American race relations. It is perhaps inevitable that Selden's account would reduce the iron-willed, self-possessed, keenly practical, and mordantly witty figure of the narrative to a cartoonish black giant. It's the only source for the tradition that Venture was illiterate and that the schoolmaster Elisha Niles transcribed the narrative. Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the Documenting Venture Smith project has been restoring Venture's voice. If we play co pay close attention to the language of the text, exploring the possible sources of words or phrases, we may be able to view a world beyond the text and to catch a glimpse of that world through Venture's eyes. Venture's idioms can point us in the direction of possible models of language. Expressions have their own histories. And through the creation of extraordinary databases of public, published material and search technologies uh, like EBSCOhost, other proprietary, proprietary databases, Google Books, Google Ngram Viewer, et cetera, it is possible to obtain important insights into the linguistic world of the narrative. Uh, Claire, could you put the first slide up, please? Uh, it's, it's up, there we go. Um, here's the text of the second and last sentences. Uh, next slide, please. That's it. My father's name was Sangam Foro, prince of the tribe of Dukandara. I descended from a very large, tall, and stout race of beings, much larger than the generality of people in other parts of the globe, being commonly considerably above six feet in height, and every way well proportioned. This passage's distinct expressions uh, can be, the, the roots can be investigated. Venture's description of his father as prince of the tribe of Dukandara has powerful biblical overtones. The phrase prince of the tribe appears in 171 books between 1700 and 1798 in virtually every case referring to the Hebrew tribes of Judah, Dan, Ephraim, etc. This engram, next slide please, charts the phrase's occurrence during this period. Uh, the next slide, we can look at that, shows the occurrence of the term in American English, i.e. publications over here. Uh, as you will see, the usage peaks in the publication year of the narrative. Venture describes himself as coming from a very large, tall, and stout race of beings, uh, much larger than the generality of people in other parts of the globe. The expression race of beings, next slide, uh, takes off in the early 1760s with uses by Lord Kames, Samuel Johnson, Henry Fielding, Lord Chesterfield, Chesterfield and Thomas Hutchinson. I want to draw your attention to one particular appearance in the Hibernian Magazine or Compendium of Entertaining Knowledge. Next slide. <clears throat> Published in 1783, where the phrase appears twice in a delightful essay called Account of the Origin and Progress of Fictitious History, which discusses fairies and describes them as a race of beings favorable to men. I'd like you to keep the Hibernian, Hibernian magazine in mind because we'll see it again. Venture describes the race of beings from which he comes as much larger than the generality of people in other parts of the globe. Next slide, please. The phrase generality of people charts a, a graph quite similar to race of beings. 
It first appears in 1649 in a Puritan tract and takes off around 1745. Uh, it has a peak of popularity in the mid 1790s, again, within five years of when Venture is composing his narrative. Finally, let's look at the last phrase of the paragraph, every way well proportioned. Next slide, please. Uh, this phrase appears in only four volumes between 1700 and 1800 in the Google Books data set. In the ident identical entries on the great legal scholar, Sir Edward Cook, in the Biographia Britannica of 1748 and the Bibliotheca Biographica of 1760, in the profile of the Duke of Albemarle in volume 646 of the Universal Magazine, published in 1770, and in the following notice in the London Chronicle of 1759. Uh, the phrase reappears in 15 newspaper articles uh, all between 1788 and 1798, all of them advertisements for, uh, for horses. I don't have that slide here, but here's the next one. Uh, Venture recounts the news that, oh, okay, very good, this is what feels on that. Uh, Venture recounts the news that invaders are coming to attack his father's allies. Two days after their retreat, the report turned out to be but true, but too true. This location turn, loc, locution turns out to be a relatively recent coinage. Um, in American publications, and let me see here. Um, uh, Can you back up, uh, Claire? Um, yeah, it's good. Um, in American publications, this is this is uh, uh, books published uh, in the United States. No, actually, this is all of them. Uh, there are almost no examples of the locution, but too true, um, until about 1783. Uh, and it, they peak around 1794, four years before Venture publishes the narrative. Unfortunately, Google does not permit searches by city or county, so we can't see what works it appears in. But it would be a mistake to think that Southeastern New England merchants and farmers would only have access to American publications. British newspapers and periodicals were in demand and in circulation throughout the colonies, particularly among the well-to-do, such as Venture's owners and their associates. One of the most unusual phrases uh, in the narrative is cupbearer. Uh, and I don't have that slide, but uh, I found only 91 examples of cupbearer as a hyphenated word in the Evans periodical series of American publications before 1800. Almost all of these refer either to the biblical figures of Pharaoh's cupbearer cup in Genesis or Nehemiah, uh, or to Nehemiah, cupbearer to Artaxerxes. The one exception is in Whitfield's Almanac. And you can uh, go forward, please. Uh, published in Newport in 1760, in a chatty New Yorker style profile of the King of Prussia. That would have been the year that Venture spent with Daniel Edwards of Hartford, the owner of whom, of whom Venture speaks most positively. We can also use Ngram, Ngram Google Books and the proprietary 18th century databases to determine that certain notable phrases in the narrative appear to be entirely original to venture, um, such as interval country, big with authority, upstart master, at odd spells. These are beautiful and apt expressions and help to underscore what a remarkable authorial voice venture commands. So to sum up, 
what this in-depth study of the texts themselves reveals is that the language of the narrative is the language of a well-educated, well-informed, up-to-date resident of British America. It is elegant, direct, idiomatic, and original. It is not overly influenced by the Bible or by religious writing, but rather by the literature of the quarterly reviews and other approved and useful publications of the 18th century. Based on the frequency of appearance of certain phrases, one could hazard the speculation that the author had access to at least several issues of the Hiber Hibernian magazine and the two volumes of the Universal History. Internal evidence, such as the passage, it may here be remembered that I related a few pages back uh, on page 21 of the narrative, strongly suggests at least that the author proofread a manuscript copy of the narrative during its composition, or otherwise that it was drafted by the author personally. In either case, it seems like uh, John Sikora's famous concept of a black message in a white envelope uh, describing slave narratives is entirely inexplicable and inappropriate in the case of Venture's narrative. He wears his society's literal, literary culture with as much confidence, elegance, and ease as any of his European American neighbors. Rather than a black message in a white envelope, we have been looking at Poe's purloined letter. An accomplished literary masterpiece has been before our eyes, unrecognized all along. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. That was really, really interesting when you look at uh, the day that in some uh, parts of the globe and certain cultures that um, obviously education is not, you're not, not for everyone. So when you think about how Venture Smith in his time had come through through adversity and, and written his own biography, it also tells me as well that it needs people like yourself, Robert, and Chandler and David and the Wilberforce Institute um, to continue that story, to share that story, because that story could have easily got lost, even though it's a story for its time. So thank you for that. I would like to just say thank you for to, to the Wilberforce Institute, as Chandler mentioned, um, for, for Sunday for the Venture Smith Challenge Cup taking the Bench Smith story to the public. Uh, thank you for their support in, in uh, sponsoring and sharing that story. And I'm sure that it will go to the schools. And on, on this note, I would just like to say uh, thank you. And I'm going to hand you over to Trevor in, in a moment. But just to say that one of Chandler's, uh, sorry, uh, Bench Smith's quotes, uh, which is instills in, I think, most of us today, is that freedom is a privilege which nothing else can equal. And that's a, a quote of Bench Smith from 1798. And thank you, Claire, for putting that up and on the screen. And I think that's really uh, prevalent to the past, the present and the future. And it shapes us who we are. And we are shaped by, you know, Venture Smith's story and it stays with us. So I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Trevor Bernard, uh, the uh, director of Wilberforce Institute. And thank you to our guest speakers, Chan Chandler, David Richardson, and Robert Forbes, Chandler Beeson. Thank you. Um, thank, thank, thank you very much, Karen, and thank you very much for, for, for sharing this so excellently. And thank you very much to our, our speakers, all who came very closely in time and gave, and, and gave fabulously interesting and, and, and exciting uh, talks on Venture Smith. Um, it's been it's been very educational and very and, and very interesting so far. Um, can I just encourage encourage members of the audience if you do have some questions and we have some questions here already that I'll I'll put I'll put forward. But if you have any questions, can you put them in the chat function? Uh, either either that I can convey to the panel, uh, or I can ask you to, uh, to 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 present the question in person. So we have a question from question first for for a whole panel, I think. Uh, which is from Abigail Bernard, um, and 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 she asks, have his have his descendants uh, been able to trace family details from his book? Uh, and she wonders also, did he mention who his mother was? So, which who would like to who would like to 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 to, to answer um, that one? I could probably. Uh, um, 
we we have nothing further uh any knowledge further of uh, venture as far as his um what happened to his mother or anything um and the same unfortunately is um uh true of his wife who he married for love uh, for over 50 years uh we do not know whether she was african american uh Native American and are part Native American. We know she was a slave in Eastern Long Island, but that's all. Um, the the family genealogy goes back uh, quite well, um, and it's uh, to a large degree uh, centered in Connecticut. Um, interestingly, both uh, Venture's descendants and the descendants of his owners um, I don't know between we probably have more than 50 documented uh of venture and several hundred of his owners and these people a number of them have been living side by side for the last 250 years in connecticut still okay david or robert did you want to make say anything in addition to that no great um the question and also sir chandler this comes from nick evans um, could you tell us more about the response of Ghanaians to Venture's narrative? Um, yeah, we're starting, uh, obviously we've j just uh, completed translating it into uh, one of the Ghanaian languages, Fonte, which is the language Venture would have uh, heard uh, by the canoeman that wrote him out to the charming Susanna in 1739. But, um, they, the the uh, Ghanaians um, look at it as a really well-written story about um, uh, a West African that obviously they relate to who goes um, off to uh, America and becomes um, overcomes the suppression but becomes um, extremely uh, successful. Um, they're not a, they're not at all surprised that he wrote a. Uh, a really great narrative. They recognize that uh, as the son of the ruler of the people, he would have been uh, well educated uh, before he left. Um, and we we know from the scarification that uh, uh, Venture had already gone through the passage to adulthood. So um, they they find the narrative of a very enjoyable story to read, but also empowering. Uh, can I say something on that? Yep. Can I say something about that, Trevor? I do think it's important that to acknowledge that um, the story has been taken up with considerable enthusiasm by uh, the former president of Ghana, John Kufo, um, um, and he was instrumental in encouraging us to get a translation of the narrative into Fante and possibly other African languages. And Kufo sees this uh, narrative, whether in English or in other languages, as a very empowering story. And he thinks it is important for uh, the youth of Ghana to appreciate that notwithstanding whatever adversities they may face in life, they can overcome those with determination, willpower, and so on, um, and uh, make a a success of their own lives. So I think the story is appealing, not at the highest level of Ghanaian politics as well, as um, having the potential to be valuable as a teaching tool in, in schools and who knows in universities in Africa. Thank you very much, David. We have a, we have a question from Susan Capes, uh, which is uh, for Rob. Uh, are there any literary references to Venture Smith in other post 18th century literary sources? In other words, is there evidence of people reading his narrative? Uh, not in the 18th century, um, but the narrative was was kept in print. Uh, not only was there the 1798 uh, edition uh, by um, Reverend Selden. Uh, but the family uh, issued an edition in 1834. Um, there, are, there are processes, and Chandler might want to talk about them, for, for trying to get at this question by looking at the, um, 
the works of the of the publisher, the New London newspaper publisher who who printed um, the narrative. Uh, but we haven't found we haven't found definitive connections. I'm, is that right, uh, uh, Chandler? Yeah, the, I mean, uh, as you say, it's always in print, uh, but um, uh, we don't, except for the um, ads, which we think were placed in two different newspapers by uh, Venture or his sons. Uh, we don't. We've never found any um, other reference. Uh, uh, to it in the 18th century. Right. In printed works. In printed works, yeah. yeah. But the copies that we have been able to trace were owned by uh, the prominent, uh, they were owned, they were owned well read and extreme, all the copies I've looked at are, are well read, extremely marked up and were owned by of uh, the prominent leading families of Eastern Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't it wasn't something that was um, a, considered a black piece of literature or anything then. Then it was uh, uh, a, a story written by an important citizen from um, uh, Connecticut. Great, thanks. We, we have a question from Rose Jenkins, and this is for the full panel. Uh, you as well, Karen. Uh, a question from the full panel, which is, how effective can stories from the past be in fighting racism today? So, David, do you want to start off with that? Unmute yourself, David. I am. Um, Here we go. <laughs> Fingers aren't as nimble as they used to be. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, for me, um, I think it is important, and I, I go back to what uh, I said earlier about uh, John Kufo in in, in Ghana. They, um, in in terms of the value of the story as an empowering story for for the youth of Ghana. But if it's if that's true of Ghana, I think it is also true in other ways in um, other parts of the world where um, there is still racial prejudice and so on um, and i think the message that comes out of it is that um, we are all better off if we collaborate rather than look for things that divide us and um, that i think is the important story for the youth of the day it's an important story which you can get out there if you encourage, for example, um, uh, teams to play for Venture Smith's Cup. Um, because the, the ethos of the team is that you are all stronger than together than as individuals. And I think uh, from an economic point of view, from a social point of view, um, and Chandler and I recently put out a blog on this. Um, you know, there are costs to racism. There are costs to social division. Um, and those costs are mitigated if to some extent we can work in harmony with each other and recognize ultimately that we're all human beings. Now, to some extent that message may gain more and more credence and power uh, as in fact we come to realize the climate crisis which is uh, coming in the world and that we're all human beings looking in fact to to mitigate the problems of climate change well in some respects uh, racism creates similar uh, and can create costs to society and therefore i do think that uh, stories like those of venture smith in which it's not just portrayed as a struggle, and rightly so, of Venture Smith to recover his freedom, but how he managed to transcend that problem, the struggle, and actually look to build a relationship with those with whom uh, he'd been seen as a, a former, uh, a, a, been previously seen as a species of property. And it's his humanity which, of course, uh, enables him 
uh, to build those relationships and the recognition of his humanity by others, which enables him to build that. And that, I think, is the key story of Benjamin Smith, his insistence that we are all human beings and that we are better off working together rather than looking to exploit each other for personal advantage or gain. That seems to me to be the key story of it. Yeah, um, I'll add a little to that. Uh, Venture um, not only succeeds in showing it, but he, he instilled it in his own family. Um, and the proof we have is um, his son, even after he's dead, is um, continuing to work with the son of his last owner, uh, Oliver Smith's son, Edmund and uh, Solomon Smith are clearly doing business and things. And um, 10 years after uh, Venture dies, uh, Solomon uh, turns around and names his son after, uh, uh, and it's 50 years after uh, Venture regained his freedom. He names a male son after the uh, former owner of his father. Um, and when we go into schools, the rare time that we can go in where we have descendants, both of Venture and the owners together, uh, you can you can feel uh, the dynamic uh, and the communication with kids and the empowerment if you have both of the uh, two sides of the of the racial uh, issue there together and talking about their joint uh, uh, things. Karen or Robert, either of you want to say anything? Well, just one thing, which is we often say that that racism is a race is a social construction. Um, that's a, a catchphrase. But what you can see in Venture is a, 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 a snapshot of a period before it had fully been constructed. Um, you had to build racism. You had to you had to actually teach uh, people to view Africans and their descendants as less than human, and that to to get a picture of what the world before that process was complete. Uh, that makes it possible to to imagine a world without racism. It's not a permanent. Uh, universal uh, component of of human existence. And unless you understand that that is a possibility, uh, you won't, won't be able to get very far uh, in trying to eradicate it. Karen, do you want to say anything or, or leave it? Yeah, I just think, think that uh, when you talk about slavery, um, when you live in, you know, and, and work in the communities where I, I live and work, that slavery is, and in even modern day slavery, is so far removed from our thoughts or, or what we do. And I think it's it's about people's priorities and what what what's important to them. So I think that they probably don't they probably don't even think that this is happening. It's not happening in my street, it's not happening where I live. And so to bring the Venture Smith story, and it, it's it's something that's happening today, to bring it to the people, um, I think you need to meet people where they're at, and that's with anything we do. So when you when the people who I've spoke to in terms of talking about the history of slavery, and I've had conversations saying, well, the, the black people so they sold their own, pe their own people, so that's where the idea of the Venture Smith Challenge Cup came from. Conversations what I've had with David around uh, that they were quite visionary in business, like you know, it, like set up as a business model. And I think I've said that correctly, David. But I, I just thought, how can I explain that to people in, in the community? So my example was that in Hull, in in East Hull, we have uh, the ferry that comes across. And I said, well, if, if the ferry comes across and it pops and says, Hull, can we buy some of your people? They're probably, nine times out of 10, they'll be talking to a red and white supporter in the east side of the city and they say, we'll sell the black and whites from the west. And and because they will sell each other off. And it's, I know that it's it, it's such, uh, 
we can laugh at that and and it's so funny but that is what then people are tuned in and they listen to that and they quite get that sort of concept that that even though whole we're, we're together as a city but sometimes we are divided but we need to hear some stories and it's about meeting people where they're at so what was you doing this weekend to young people oh the smith challenge cup well what's that about if we've not talk, spoke about that and went Smith challenge cup they might not be, I don't know if that's the word exposed, but they might not have even heard of who Venture Smith is. And that's why it's important that Rob, David, Chandler and the Wilberforce Institute can share that story and meet people where they're at, because it doesn't matter what business model you've got, if you've not got uh, the person who's going to buy that product, who's going to listen. So that's where that Venture Smith Challenge Cup came from. Great, thank you, thank you. We've got a couple more questions. The first one is from Richard Price uh, for the panel as well, and he asks, given the significant amount of heritage plaques uh, erected to Frederick Douglass, thereby raising public, public consciousness of him, are there any plans to erect more heritage markers to venture in the USA, UK or Ghana? And, and I think that fits in with, uh, with, with, with Judith Spikesley's um, uh, question. Uh, which is why is Venture Smith's story not better known? So why are there not more plaques and, and, and statues and why is, why is Venture Smith's story not better known? I guess we are the two questions that, that the panel might want to want to ask, answer. Yeah. Well, can I just come, come in there first? With the Venture Smith Challenge Cup, uh, it's going, going to be part of the Rugby League, piggyback off the Rugby League World Cup next year. So it's going to go nas uh, national and probably world international. So that's a place that you can see where the Venture Smith story is coming through in terms of, you know, for, for the public sharing sharing that story. But it, obviously there's scholars here, they, David and Chandler and yourselves, Robert, that's something which that, you know, maybe that you could maybe enlighten. Um, as far as uh, plaques and markers, actually in, in Connecticut, um, I'm, I'm trying to think, Rob. It's more than uh, 20 years that the um, uh, gravesite and the tombstone have been uh, recognized as uh, national land um, historic markers and all. So, but the problem, in a way, you could say the problem is that um, unlike Frederick Douglass, who goes around the country and everything, venture is pretty well centered on the eastern Long Island basin. Um, so he's in a, in, a, in a small geographical area um, where uh, the markers and things that are up are just not uh, being seen by the mainstream. But uh, clearly the other problem has been the, the story has, has been uh, mainly known in uh, a, basically just in eastern Connecticut um, and eastern Long Island. And that's what our job is, is, and that's what all this effort of uh, printing narratives and the uh, school programs and the exhibit is to expand it. Hopefully, uh, going forward, uh, when we launch it into an app, uh, we'll start to reach the rest of America. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Joel. Okay. In addition. You know the the work that that Chandler has has uh, has launched uh, to recognize that the narrative of Venture Smith is not it does not fit into the category of slave narrative dictated to a white abolitionist or a white person. It's actually a, a uh, one of the most uh, brilliant literary American literary works uh, of the 19th century of the 18th century um, recognizing that this is ventures own voice uh, that process is is raising the profile uh, of of this individual um, and I think that's almost a necessary precondition uh, to his commemoration. Uh, more broadly uh, around the region and the country. Yeah, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, 
One is that uh, Venture's story is one that informs the the Museum of African American Life in in, in Washington D.C. And I think that that in itself is a significant achievement because it places him alongside, uh, therefore, Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther and so on and so forth. So I think there is some recognition there. The other thing to say is that um, work on the Venture Smith project is 15 years old. We've had a scholarship and other works on Equiano for at least 50 or 60 years. Uh, we've had even more work done over a longer period of time on Frederick Douglass and so on. Um, I think we're in the process of making Venture Smith better known. Um, um, the time frame in which we've been operating is just 15 years compared to the longer schedule of others. And therefore, in a way, it's quite remarkable how much we've achieved rather than how little we've achieved in a 15 year project. Given that this project hasn't, in fact, attracted huge amounts of external public uh, or funding council money in the way that some other projects have done. So um, I think that's important. Um, the fact that Venture Smith didn't take an overtly anti-slavery position, but rather talked about freedom rather than slavery, um, is I think also significant because it makes his story in some ways less appealing to those who want to see it as to see his narrative in an anti-slavery sort of way and but I do think we're, we've achieved quite a remarkable amount in a relatively short period of time and hopefully uh, others will pick up the torch on this one um, and, and run with it as years go on and that makes me so please, that people like Karen are interested in this story, and hopefully other scholars will become interested in it too. Great, thanks very much. We have one final question from uh, also, also from Nick Evans, um, which is let me just find it here. Uh, which part of the Adventure Smith project, Nick asks, is most effective uh, in raising a, awareness of black of black history on either side of the Atlantic? What lessons can you share with other organisations and groups seeking to raise awareness of such stories? Well, I would. Rob's had more, Rob's had more experience with promoting other figures. So, Rob, do you want to do you want to give a go for that that that, that question? Well, I would I would uh, point to uh, Karen's. Um, uh, very important uh, point, which is you have to meet people where they are. Um, and what uh, I think has been has been uh, a particular uh, feature of the the venture Smith story is that we have it, it 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 we have descendants of venture Smith and descendants of venture Smith's owners. and that actually, takes it in a sense out of history and makes it something that is real today. Um, that's been that's been tremendously important. Um, the other thing that has been a, a great vehicle for the story is the extraordinary uh, exhibit that Chandler largely single-handedly uh, has has created. Um, I don't know how many people saw it when it was up in Hull, but but uh, there were large crowds whenever I was there. Um, it's it has um, been on display in the uh, U.S. Capitol, um, in the State House in Connecticut, many other places, um, and it it always. Uh, there are people who find it riveting and and who really their understanding of this whole story um, changes dramatically because of it. So I would I would point to that as one of the very effective tools that we have. Uh, can I also add to that? I think that for the Wilberforce Institute, um, and that goes back to David and 
Nick Evans and now Trevor Bernard and John Oldfield and Chandler, well, all of you, I think that the Wilberforce Institute as an institution recognise that it's not just through the academia where as a platform where people can learn, research and teach. And they've actually welcomed uh, people uh, from community, you know, from communities to, you know, Wilberforce Institute is not just a building, but they make it welcome so that it's accessible and that and they're actually not just what, what we can do for you. It's, you know, it's about going out and listening to communities. And this is a real good example where where people can join in a webinar or a seminar and not feel that just because they're not attending a university that there's, there's something that's that it's not for them and that it's not too it's not too formal and i think the opportunity of, of venture smith you know the narrative the biography in, of, of coming to hull it for me venture smith is like something i cannot believe that was then when people are going through that now it's current current day and it's just so that it's so easy as well to understand it and listen to it if you're meeting people where they're at. It's not technical, and but yet at the same time, for its time, it was something unique. So thanks to the Wilberforce Institute for, you know, for bringing that to Hull, because that wouldn't have happened through the hard work of Chandler and yourself, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, David. Just, just one thing. I, I do. We, we tend to think of this as a sort of an Anglo-American project, but in fact, there's a very important development of it into Africa too. And I think it offers the opportunities to have a fairly frank discussion uh, with academics and others in Ghana, and no doubt in the future in other places in Africa, about the nature of the slave trade, the nature of slavery. Ultimately, it was a shared history, albeit an uneven one in terms of where the power relationships lay, but nevertheless, it is a shared history. And we need to understand it in those terms and see how we can then move on from that in, in developing other shared agendas um, um, uh, as we go forward and hopefully more productive and positive ones. So I do think, uh, the future of the project lies possibly as much in Africa and building relations with Africa. And through this project, I really do think that there's an opportunity for the Wilberforce Institute to develop closer connections, for example, with Cape Coast Universities, which is one of the premier research orientated universities in Africa. And I, I really do feel that. Thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you, Ken, uh, Karen, Chandler, and Robert. Um, and, 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 and I think it was particularly good, David and Karen's words at the end uh, to, to talk about uh, um, where we can go further and, and, and just the importance of VentureSmith. So um, it, it, it particularly, uh, I know that Chandler and Robert have done a huge amount of work uh, in, in here. But David, on behalf of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, has also been instrumental in, in making VentureSmith more no, better known. Um, and, and it is something, as, as Karen has pointed out, that means something for this community as well for a larger academic world. So thank you very much. Um, before we leave, uh, and, and before I just give a final thanks to um, our, our, our speakers, uh, I just want to mention two particular events that we have coming up, both of which are, are going to be very interesting. Karen uh, is, is a repeat um, a, 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 a repeat speaker in, in these ones. We have a very interesting uh, talk by Alex Renton, uh, as, as well as Cecile Oxal and, and, and Karen Okra uh, on the British family's legacies of slave ownership and its relevancy today. So this finishes, uh, completes the list of 2021, what has been a very active Black History Month uh, in, in, in terms of all sorts of activities. And I, I certainly would think that this would be something that people would be very interested in, uh, not only in interested in terms of slavery, but in terms of the connections between slavery and the present day in terms of genealogy, history, and those sorts of things. And we have uh, three people with different types of relationships uh, to Caribbean slavery of the 18th and 19th century uh, that, will, that, 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 that will present interesting views on these one things. 
We also mentioned on the 2nd of December, we have a, 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 a seminar remembering that we do, know, we do both modern slavery as well as historical slavery, uh, and that we have class discrimination and children's rights uh, by Professor Geraldine Van Buren, QC. Um, so I welcome you to that. Well, one other thing that I've mentioned to you just before I thank the speakers uh, is that we had a very successful launch last week of a new initiative from the Wilberforce Institute, uh, which is the Action to Combat Modern Slavery Justice Hub, uh, with the manager being Andrew Smith here. And, and this is going to be a very important, uh, important venue by which we try and do our best uh, to combat the scourge of modern slavery. And, and you'll probably hear more about those soon. Um, but it, it forced me finally just to thank uh, very much David, Chandler, Robert and Karen uh, for your really interesting presentations and for allowing us uh, into that interesting world of, of, of Venture Smith, uh, 18th century slave trade um, and his legacy to the present day. So thank you very much, all of you. And we look forward to seeing you on the 4th of November, uh, if not before. Thank you.